We're going to look at a lecture on DNS. We're going to do a quick review of the basics so that we kind of get a refresher. And then we're going to plunge into a, a review of a topic of DNS that most people don't get a chance to deep dive into. And that's the DNS root servers themselves. Most of us have seen a, a DNS hierarchical chart showing the root DNS server. Below it, we see the top level domain DNS servers. Below that is our authoritative servers. Most of us have seen this. What I want to do is I do want to focus on the root server in this presentation, but a quick review of how all of this works. For me, I have learned that an, a big picture overview of any topic helps me incredibly when I start digging into the details. If I don't have that big picture of any technology, I really struggle to understand it. Let's take a look at this diagram because it really helps us understand DNS. And let's start with the user. The user, let's say, is going to go amazon.com. But we know we can't get anywhere with just a name such as amazon.com. What the user really needs is an IP address. And so we're going to depend on the next entity in DNS, which is the resolving name server to help us get that IP address. For me, in my case, I have Time Warner or Spectrum as my ISP, and they also provide my home PCs with DNS services. So they're going to be my resolving name server. They're going to go out and try to find the IP address of Amazon.com. Their goal, remember, their goal is to find the authoritative name servers for Amazon.com. Hopefully we can get to Amazon Web Services, which probably hosts the DNS system for Amazon. And with once we've reached those authoritative name servers, we're going to ask for the IP address of Amazon.com. Once we've pulled that record out of the Amazon DNS system, it's going to be sent back to my browser and I'll get to surf the website. All right, we're going to drill into some of the details, but this will really help you understand what's going on. Notice the arrows between the user browser, the resolving name server, and the authoritative name servers. All of those er arrows represent DNS queries. There's two basic types, non-recursive DNS queries and recursive DNS queries. The packets that contain DNS queries are very small, 600 bytes in size. This is a captured DNS packet. The size of this packet is the beauty of DNS. It makes this whole system efficient. Now let's take a look at the authoritative name servers. In the DNS architecture, this is the key. Our browser wants accurate information about Amazon.com. I don't want to go to Walmart for information about Amazon. Or if I want to go to CVS Health Corporation, I don't want to go to AT&T. So every company will own and manage its own authorized DNS name server so that we can go to their website and get accurate information about that company. Now, authorized name servers, managing and host, hosting these authorized name servers is very expensive. If you're a big company, you can afford to do that. But a lot of smaller companies use enterprise DNS hosting companies. So when we talk about a lot of smaller companies, they need that authoritative domain server, but they can't afford. They're very expensive to manage, very expensive to secure. So they may go to something like Cloudflare, or you may go to Azure. Azure has their own DNS public service that they provide. Uh, it's, it's pricey, it's expensive but you get very, very good, reliable DNS. Another provider of that would be Google. Google has their own cloud DNS system. You can purchase that and you can host your authoritative name server with Google. Another one is GoDaddy. They have a very 
well-known, very respected DNS system that you can also use. And of course, Amazon. Amazon has their Amazon Route 53. You can provide, they provide you with authoritative DNS services through the Amazon Web Service System. Now, these are only just a few. There's a lot of people will take your money and host your DNS services. All right, what about people that are cheap or poor, but they need an authoritative name server? Well, there are some companies that host for free authoritative name servers for various entities. So if you're a nonprofit or you're an individual, there is free DNS hosting out there for your authoritative name server. All right, our last concept as we look at this diagram in our review of DNS, and that's the actual record in the DNS server. We see things like the IP address, the IP version four of a domain name. We see the IP version six of the domain name. We see information like the mail server. So the record information in the DNS server is a critical part of DNS. Now, everything we've shown you just before is a simplified view and a review of DNS, but none of that will work when you're talking about a worldwide network as big as what we have on our planet. Let's start with 1.8 billion websites. And when we start talking about 3.9 billion users, we've got to have a serious and a complex DNS system. Let's look at a DNS query again. This time I'm gonna bring in the root servers, the top level domain DNS servers, and let's take a look at how this operates. So we're back to John, he's gonna to go to lowes.com. He needs to find a local DNS resolver that will get this process started because he can't do anything with a name. He needs an IP address. So in my case, I'm gonna use Spectrum's DNS server to begin the process. Now I'm going to start with the root server. The root server is going to be contacted. It's gonna give me the information of who owns the top level domain for .com. And in this case, that's VeriSign. VeriSign hosts the entire .com top level domain DNS system. Once that information is passed back, it's gonna tell me the authoritative name servers, DNS servers for Lowe's.com. And I've got that information below. That information is gonna send me the IP address of Lowe's.com. That's gonna be sent to my browser. And if all goes well, I'm gonna to connect to Lowe's.com and actually be able to buy something online. So I'm on Lowe's homepage and I'm going to use a Chrome extension by DNSlytics. It's a very cool tool and it allows me to see some very interesting information. First of all, I can see the IP address of Lowe's.com and I can see that the website is hosted in the Netherlands. If I go to domain, I can scroll down and see, yep, I'm in the Lowe's.com domain. And if I keep scrolling down, I can see the authoritative name servers for Lowe's.com. So how in the world can Lowe's be hosted in the Netherlands and yet I have this fast traffic back and forth? Well, that all magic is a whole nother subject, but since we're here, let's take a look. This is being, the magic of this website being in Netherlands and yet I'm able to see it and interact with it with incredible speed is because it's using a content delivery network, a CDN, in this case, Alchemy. All right, let's get back to what we came here for. Let's take a look at DNS root servers. So who in the world's responsible for root servers? Well, the overarching organization is ICANN. This is a global policy making organization. It has members all over the world, companies, governments, and they are the oversight to root servers. ICANN then pushes this responsibility to a sub-organization called IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. They're responsible for the root zone. They're also responsible for the database of the top level domains. 
They have a lot of other responsibilities, but we're going to focus on root servers. The DNS root infrastructure is made up of 13 name root servers. They are operated by 12 independent organizations. In the early days of the internet, most of the root servers resided within the United States. That has radically changed. There are now over 750 instances of these 13 root servers all across the globe. When it comes to DNS root servers, not everybody is equal here. When it comes to managing and operating root servers, we can see that the operators really vary. Some of the root server operators manage up to 200 plus root servers. Some of them maybe only manage six root servers. So it's not always equal in these operators that manage root servers. We can see the University of Maryland, NASA, ISC, VeriSign, ICANN are the biggest root server operators. Right now, as we speak, there's over 750 root server instances. Remember, just because you host a root server doesn't mean you can manage the only person in the world that can modify or log in or control or administer a root server is those operators. On any given day, just one root server, and I looked up the statistics for the A root server, up to 8 billion queries a day on just one root server. Because root servers are so critical in DNS, there is intense interest in the data, the statistics, the metrics of every root server. In the world of root servers, monitoring is serious business. IANA requires all root servers to establish probes, pieces of equipment that can monitor metrics and data, so they can collect serious data on every single root server on the planet. This was an interesting photo from a island between the mainland of Norway and the North Pole. It's one of the world's most northernmost inhabited areas. And you can see their rack of routers, and they actually have a root server probe monitoring the performance of root servers way up there. Root servers IP address are very, very important. And in the last few years, there have been IP address changes. They are very monitored, rolled out very carefully, so there's very little disruption on DNS. All right, Mr. Vanderbilt, this is really cool. Uh, root servers have a database, a DNS database. Just how big is this database? So exactly what is in a root server? Well, it contains over 1,500 generic top-level domain IP addresses as to where to find the top-level domain servers for .com, .net, .org. It also contains the country code top-level domains, such as China, Indonesia. It also contains the IDS, the internationalized domain name. All of that is in the root zone database. So if I wanted to host a root server for DNS, uh, what kind of hardware would I need? Well, believe it or not, what you're seeing is the recommended hardware uh, basically a 1U rack with X amount of CPU capability, storage, etc. And that's typically all you need to handle a root server. All right, wait a minute, Mr. Vanderpool. That little server is not going to handle 8 billion queries. That's correct. Remember, we distribute root servers all over the world. Just in case you're interested, the .com is the largest top-level domain DNS service. It has over 139 million records for the .com. The next largest record is going to be for China. We also see .net, UK, .org. VeriSign hosts some of the largest top-level domain DNS servers in the world. They host the entire .com, .net, .tv, .cc, and .name. So what is the software that makes the DNS server work? The software that runs DNS is typically BIND version 9. BIND is a very, very popular open source 
uh, DNS software. It runs on Linux and Windows. There's another one called NDS, and it's a called Name Service Daemon, and another one called Knots DNS, and this is done by the Czech Republic. All three of these different software packages are running root server. Running root servers is serious business. If you have 750 instances, you've got to have a lot of people. When it comes to managing root servers, this is a conference held for root server operators. You can tell they're geeks. They got their laptops, their phones. None of them are paying attention to the presentation. Typical geeks. All right, we've looked at a lot of things about DNS. Let's get out of the slide deck and let's go drive around a little bit. This is the root server's official web page for the operators. And you can see they have a map showing you the location of all the instances of the root servers. If we scroll down, you can see there the root servers are listed as A, and I can choose B, choose C, and you can see where they're located and who is the operator. So here on the website, you can see I'm looking at root server D. It's hosted by the University of Maryland. You can see over 154 sites. That's the IP address, IP version 4 address for that root server. It also has an IP version 6. Let's go trace route. To trace route a root server, I'm going to use some really cool web tools. Newstar has some great tools. Let me show you. This particular company has just a ton of great, great tools. Let's start with Ultra Tools. And we're going to go to tracing tools and I'm going to do a tracer and I'm going to simply click in the IP address of a root server and I'm going to choose up to 64 hops and go. As we look at the trace route that this tool gives us, we can see geolocation as we're going from router to router from this website to the root server. We can see we jump to the United States and then we jump to Germany and then here we jump to Ireland and then back to the United States. Normally in Traceroute you don't get to see that. So here at the end of the Traceroute we see that it was eight hops from this web server that hosted our tool to our DRoot server. It was eight hops. Here's another cool tool. It's called the DNS speed test and it's a DNS hosting speed tool gives you valuable information about DNS performance for each level in the DNS tree. I'm going to go ahead and put in Lowe's.com. So let's go take a look. So let's remember everything we learned. To get to Lowe's.com, I first need a resolving server. That is going to try to locate a root server. So I'm going to scroll down here and we can see as a resolving server tries to find F root, M root, I root, you can see the different speeds that each of these root servers perform at. Next, we have the top level domain for .com and you can see each of those vary in speed. And then last, we look at our authoritative DNS servers for Lowe's.com. We can see all of them listed and the speeds that they perform at as, a, as it pertains to queries. Now let's take a look at our authoritative servers for Lowe's.com and we can see if you're trying to get an IP version 6 address, it's actually faster than over here where you're trying to get an IP version 4. All of this metrics helps give you, an administrator of a website, some, in, some idea of how your DNS is performing. You can even run a domain health report on your website and it gives you a lot of information about your DNS authoritative server. So again, if you don't understand those basics, then when I go and deep dive, you're lost. This is all about your authoritative name server. Now there is some really odd stuff out there concerning DNS root servers. Let's take a look. And it's called the Yeti DNS project. It's live, it's IP version 6 only root DNS server. You can take a look at the uh, website. Let's take a look. You can go to the Yeti DNS project and take a look. It's pretty cool. Let's talk quickly about DNS privacy and we'll look at DNS cyber attacks and security. Remember our diagram. So here is you at home or at your company or on your phone. This first DNS resolver knows everywhere you want to go. Every website, every domain you travel to, the owner of this DNS resolver knows about you. 
So if you have an ISP like Comcast, ATT, Verizon, or for your mobile phone, Verizon, T-Mobile, they're, they're resolving your DNS queries. They know all about you. If you're on a company's network, they know all about where you're going on the internet. And honestly, most of them have legal rights to do so. But what if it was a government? They could find out everything you do. Your DNS traffic can be sniffed, collected, and analyzed, and then used or sold. Wouldn't it be nice to have somebody you could trust that would do your DNS resolving, know everywhere you go, but not care and, not, and promise you privacy, reliability, and speed. So Cloudflare.com offers two public DNS servers. The first one is 1.1.1. The other one is 9.9.9.9. These DNS servers provide you free public DNS service. They guarantee your privacy. They're highly reliable and they're fast. You can also get Cloudflare on your mobile phone so you can take T-Mobile out of the picture. You can take Verizon out of the picture. You can download the 1.1 app and install it and you'll have a new DNS resolver. There are other companies that ho host public DNS systems, but Cloudflare, Cloudflare.com promises privacy. They guarantee privacy. They don't care. They don't want your data. They don't want to target you with ads. They're also very, very fast in comparison to Google's public DNS or Cisco's D open DNS. They're very, very fast. You can set it up on iPhone, Android, Mac, Windows, Linux, or your home router. And no, cloudflare.com doesn't sponsor anything I do. They probably don't know I exist, but I do like their services. There are serious DNS attacks going on. Talos, FireEye, the Department of Homeland Security, CrowdStrike, the SANS Institutes have all released many, many white papers on serious attacks on DNS as of 2019. Because root servers are monitored so intensely, the real attacks on DNS are at top level domains. This year, through cyber espionage, over 50 Middle East records were altered in the top level domain. This allowed DNS hijacking, record manipulation, DNS fronting. Some of it was done through credential theft of accounts on domain registrars and some stealing SSL certificates on DNS vendors. Altering a few records on a top level domain DNS server could easily put the bad guys in a man in the middle attack. Think of any country's national security agency. If you put a man in the middle, it would put that agency in severe compromise. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Feel free to contact me if you'd like notes or slides, just send me an email.